I've mentioned the sunrise and sunset effect in a number of my videos and some subscribers are asking what is that and how can I see it for myself? Stick around and we'll go through that. Hey everybody, my name is Paul, W1VLF, and welcome back to the lab. Well, we're still messing around in the uh, long wave and VLF bands, and uh, it's, it's the middle of March now, so things are going to start getting noisy real quick. <clears throat> so I thought I would uh, do a video on the sunrise and sunset effect. That, that's easily seen on some of the VLF transmitters as they make the transition between day and night. A couple people have asked me about that, and in fact, um, for monitoring, for other reasons too, like uh, SIDS, you know, sudden ionospheric disturbances, we're using the uh, low impedance loop that you guys saw in a previous video out in the backyard to make this. Um, so a couple things I wanted, I wanted to talk about. <clears throat> First off, 3 to the 30 kilohertz is VLF. I'm going to be using 40 kilohertz, or a little over 40 kilohertz. It's a uh, station NAU, um, communications, submarine communications stations like NAA and, and, and all the other ones, only it's in Puerto Rico. So that gives me a good 1,600 mile path to cover. So what you'll see when this happens, when the sunrise effect and sunset effect happen, you'll, it, it's pretty dramatic. Um, I went, I made it, the, the recording I made was initially 16 hours. I compressed it in time to about 17 minutes, and even that was kind of long because the, the, the real meat of the program is here at local sunset and again at local sunrise. So I'll leave those pieces sort of intact when that transition was happening when you see it later on uh, when I play the video. I'll leave those transitions intact, and then <clears throat> that long period of time um, of during the night where there's very little activity, just basically a straight line as far as amplitude goes. Uh, I'm going to squeeze that up even more. So, but the but the whole the whole recording was about 17 hours long, 16 or 17 hours long. Uh, I made a few adjustments in the beginning, um, just so you could get an idea of the scale of, of these dips. I have a calibrated attenuator, and in the very beginning, I show the signal, you know, graphing across. Then I make a 10 dB drop for about 10, 15 minutes, then a 20 dB drop for 10 or 15 minutes, and then let it go back to the normal signal strength. This allows you to look at it and see relatively, because the scale on SkyPipe that I'm using is not, uh, it's not calibrated in dB, but you can get a pretty good idea of what's going on when you see how fast these dips and everything are. Um, I could use NAA up in Maine, at 24 kilohertz, but it's it's only 500 miles away, and the and the, the what you can see is not nearly as uh, as dramatic. I had more notes here. I guess I left them in the other room. Um, anyway, oh, a couple other things to uh, real quick. Um, I had a lot of fun last week. I was on the uh, virtual ham expo, answering uh, RFI type questions. So that was kind of cool. I wish. I wish the whole thing had worked out a little bit better, but um, unfortunately it didn't. But it was still a really cool platform, so I'm pretty excited, pretty excited about doing that again sometime. Um, let's see, Francesco had said, hey, can you, um, can you get rid of those mystery cores and, uh, and use something that we all can buy? And I said, you know what, you're absolutely right. So I've got some number 75 cores um, that I'll be experimenting with. Uh, in a new version of the low impedance loop. Um, and I think you're going to really like that because it's, it's kind of a dramatic increase in signal strength. Um, and also, I don't know if you guys can see this. I'll give you a quick close-up of that in a second. <clears throat> I'm going to do another shootout between the, uh, the, the, the reference, um, you know, uh, two-foot loop. And this is also two-foot loop, but this is using screening. This is using a quarter inch by 24 inch wide screening, uh, and this is the 5 8 um, copper pipe. Um, and I will always be using from now on on these antennas to test them 
uh, a number 75 core. I'll give you the details of that in the next video, um, but I don't have really all that much time to, to do that right now. Um, hang on a second. <sighs> the pause that refreshes. But I just sort of can't get this whole low impedance loop idea out of my head, and um, you'll see. There's some, there's some really cool stuff coming, and hopefully this weekend, if it doesn't snow again, it's supposed to snow tomorrow, we'll get some time to get out in the woods and get it into a really quiet area. So anyway, the recording you're going to see today was made with the five foot low impedance loop uh, made out of flashing. Now it does flap around a lot in the breeze, kind of like, <laughs> like my gums flapping in the breeze. No, um, so that's one of the one of the detriments to using that, and that's why I, I'm going with this uh, essentially what's called hardware cloth. Um, but anyway, I don't want to get too carried away. Uh, you'll see a picture of what antenna I use to make these. The path is 1,660 something miles. Um, now I'm going to go into a PowerPoint, kind of explain what's going on, and we'll go from there. Okay, guys, thanks. Um, I think I'll just run over to the camera real quick, and I'll do a like a quick preview shot of this antenna. Looks really funny, right? It looks kind of uh, hacked together, and it really is. But I did I already did some comparisons, and it's uh, it's pretty cool. So, all right, let's head over to the desk. Okay, remember this one? The original loop and then the tilting mechanism and all that baloney. So now we're using, uh, can you read that? Number 75 cores. Thanks, Francesco, because if he hadn't pushed me into uh, or, or brought it to my attention, I would have left it with the mystery cores. So anyway, let's swing over to the other one real quick. All right. In, in, in the W1VLF lab, you use what you got. You run what you brung is the old term that we used to, we used to say. And uh, here's my sort of transformer, not transformer, my coupling uh, section. And you can see this is the, um, if it'll focus. Well, that's interesting. It, it has a hard time focusing because it's looking right through that. Um, and and this, is <laughs> this is my quick disconnect. Um, and the reason I made this quick disconnect was because I was trying the number 75 cores compared to the mystery cores. And this number 75 is significantly better. All right, that's enough of that for a teaser. And we'll shoot off to the desk and we'll go through the PowerPoint. And then you can see the, the presentation. We'll go from there. Thanks. W1VLF. Out. Okay, everybody. So here's the, the, the entire capture of the overnight uh, plot of um, NAU from Puerto Rico. This is uh, 16 hours, and you can see these really dramatic dips here. And then after local sunrise, um, you'll see quite a long period of rather undisturbed um, uh, you know, amplitude. And then again, you'll see uh, quite a dip there as we go through local sunrise. This was done about five days ago, I think, during um, during the, uh, well, I mean, five days ago, but it was before the, um, the time change um, to uh, daylight savings time. So, um, and what you're going to see is a, I have a clock running and, you, well, anyway, so here's, here's the overview. This piece here is, is going to be of interest as we, as we go forward. So let's click up here. So what do you need to do this um, for monitoring uh, sunrise sunset effect? And, and by the way, I don't know the, the mechanical physics mechanism behind what exactly happens. Uh, this stuff takes place at local sunset and local sunrise. Um, but as far as the real mechanics, I, I don't know. But let, well, let's continue. Um, you need a distant station. For me, I'm going to be using NAU. It's in Puerto Rico. It's on 40.75 kilohertz. Um, so that's not tip technically in the VLF band uh, range from 3 to 30 kilohertz. But it's, uh, it's very close. Uh, and, and the effect is still the same. You need a VLF capable receiver. And in this case, um, I'm using the Air, Air Spy Discovery. Uh, can easily see down to uh, 10 kilohertz uh, and even down into the audio uh, spectrum without any problems at all. Um, some, you need some VLF capable software. Um, and I think for what I'm using, SDR console in this case worked out really well. 
Um, the antenna has to be capable of receiving signals down there. And I'm using the low impedance, uh, excuse me, low impedance loop uh, with no preamps or anything like that. So um, this is kind of wide band in a sense where it, it can see from six, at least from the the um, low for bit, the low um, NDBs in the, in the three, 400 kilohertz down to 10 kilohertz without any problem. Um, so that's, that's what I'm using. And that's five feet on a side, just sitting like four inches off the ground out in the backyard and some amplitude recording software. And that's radio sky pipe in this, in this, um, situation. Here's the uh, link to get to radio sky pipe. I can't go into how to set it all up and everything because that's kind of not in the scope of this, but, um, there's a free download and you can experiment with it. It's relatively intuitive. So um, if you have any interest in doing this sort of thing, I would definitely go get that software. It's basically a chart recorder that works from the audio output of your normal receiver, your, you know, your, your hardware type receiver, your SDR, um, and, and graphs the amplitude of that. Um, here's, oh, that's nice. Got half my uh, Puerto Rico over here uh, covered up. Uh, if you go to um, Wikipedia and uh, there's a list of VLF transmitters, this is the one we're going to be using. Uh, it's, it's NAU. It's in uh, Aguada, Puerto Rico, 40.75 kilohertz. And if you click on this, uh, you can uh, get a map that will show you right where the transmitter is. And they're using a 1,200 foot tower. Um, here's the path from where we are here in New England to Puerto Rico. And that's around 1,600 miles, and 99% of it looks like it's over water. So that's kind of an interesting candidate. Uh, I could go from here up to Maine, uh, but that's only a 500, 400, 500 mile path. And then there's a few that are out in um, North and South Dakotas here, and then some that are in Seattle, Washington, which I guess is not really on, on the picture here. But anyway, this is the path of the signal that I chose to use. Here's the transmitter. Uh, site. You can go on Google Earth and see that. It's right there on the water, so uh, there's maybe a half a mile between it and the water, and um, that's a shot of the transmitter. So when we, going back again to this, I, I said I would talk about this a little bit more. Um, let's see, what time is it here? I, I snapped this at 3.30. I think I started the, the whole recording at around 3 o'clock, or whatever this is. I, I don't even know if this is... It, calibrated in 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 utc or exactly what it is but this is real time locked to the computer so this is this is where i started it and here's the original signal right here this is the incoming signal this level right here is when i put a 10 db attenuator in for 15 minutes so you could see that level and here is another uh, one with a 20 db attenuator in so you get kind of an idea from uh, from the middle between these two points is is 10, 20, and you'll see how dramatic the dip is as as we go forward. Um, let's go back and see. Uh, 20 dB gets you uh, well past 29.30, and uh, so you can see how deep the the dip is here and when this happens. Oh, by the way, this clock will be spinning like crazy because I took one sample every second. Uh, and that ended up being like 17 or 18 minutes. And if you think about looking at this grow across a line in 17 minutes, that's boring as hell, right? And all the fun stuff is happening here. That's me right there, right? With the 10 and 20 dB. So what the what's this? This must be 30 dB or so of, of drop. And this must be even more. Um, and you can see how flat this is. So I'm going to take this section right here and I'm going to speed it up even further and I'll, I'll let this kind of stuff run at real time. Hopefully get this down to a manageable uh, piece so it, it won't bore everybody. So is that it? Nope. Oh, there's the old man himself. Um, this is what I'm using right now. This is six inch. It's, it's five feet on a side. It looks more, more than that because I'm behind it for one thing, plus there's a foot and a half of snow on the ground and um, it's on top of an eight by eight. So it's roughly five feet on a side. Uh, I think that's it. Yeah, that's it. So I'm gonna sign off here and then what I'll do is uh, you'll you'll see the, the, um, the actual chart growing. Um, one other thing real quick, uh, when we look at this, 
right here, all this noise, uh, you're going to see it flutter. You're going to see it bounce up and down an awful lot. Okay. Um, that's a lot. There's a lot of lightning noise that night. So this will be bouncing around quite a bit, but this is still well out of the noise. Um, um, this is my neighbor's fence. We talked about that before. It's the third harmonic of 11 kilohertz uh, or fourth harmonic of 11 kilohertz. So something like 44 kilohertz and with the, with the, the energy all the way down here. But anyway, Let's get over there and uh, stop jibber-jabbering. This is W1VLF signing out.